um, good evening. My name is Madeline Adams. I'm the CEO here at Jest. And on behalf of Jest, um, I wanted to welcome everyone to this installment, tonight's installment of the Jazz Book Club, Reading Between the Lines. Um, this is one of our newer programs and uh, so excited that it is hopefully here to stay, um, especially because of our host tonight that I'll, I'll, explain, I'll introduce in a minute. Um, if you have joined every session or if this is your first time, you are surely in for a treat. I enjoyed reading the first few stories of this book and so I have the I actually I was really enjoyed the opportunity to physically read a book instead of on an e-reader or um, audio book. So um, uh, if you don't have it, I urge you to get it already. And if you're in the Nashville area, we're grateful for Parnassus Books to have added us to their book club shelves and to provide a discount for in-person purchases. Um, they will ship outside of Ten uh, Nashville as well, but um, thank you to local vendors for helping us out. So before we dive in, I uh, wanted to let you know about the many programs that JAST has coming up. If you're not already on our mailing list, you can sign up with the link that Peyton will drop into the chat. And upcoming events include the Japanese moon viewing at Chikwit Estate and Gardens in partnership with Chikwit and the Consulate General of Japan in Nashville. And that is on October 9th. JAST is hosting our eighth annual Women's Leadership Forum and Networking Luncheon on October 20th at the Frist Art Museum, the Memphis Japan Festival on November 6th at the Memphis Botanical Gardens, and the Southeast U.S. Japan Conference in Orlando November 16 to 18. Many more items on the upcoming events list, but that uh, will get you into November. Um, now for the main event. Our host tonight, Yurina Yoshikawa, grew up moving between Tokyo and California and holds a BA from Barnard College and an MFA from Columbia University, where she also taught undergraduate writing. Yurina has also worked in the book publishing industry and moved with her husband to Nashville in 2017 and currently works as a creative writing instructor at The Porch. Her writing has appeared in publications, including NPR, Lit Hub, the Japan Times, and the New Inquiry, just to list a few. And if you're in the Nashville area, you may have seen her writing in the recent Edible Nashville magazines this year. Um, they are also all, I know she has links on her website, yurinayoshikawa.com. Um, Yurina was a 2019 to 20 Oz Art Wire Fellow, the winner of the 2020 Tennessee True Stories Contest, and a 2021 recipient of the Tennessee Arts Commission. So without further ado, um, I'm looking forward to um, listening about uh, these books and to hearing everybody's opinions. So thank you again so much for joining us tonight. Well, Marina. thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Um, you know, I have to say I am I'm such a fan of everything that um, the Japan Society, the Japan America Society of Tennessee puts out. Um, I recently went to a really wonderful in-person event at a sake restaurant and got to meet a lot of the people who are part of this organization in person. And I'm just really looking forward to many more. Um, and thank you uh, to Jast for letting me run this to do this. And this is our third uh, installment of um, this Zoom Reading Between the Lines series. And after each session, I just feel so inspired and um, it just gets me really excited to, to continue reading more Japanese literature that's been translated. And it's just really fun being able to share this with you all in this space. So thank you all so much. Um, I want to make sure that everybody can see and hear me okay. If, you know, at, if there's any sort of technical issues at any point, um, I will be looking at the chat. Uh, so you can feel free to kind of like tell me that there. Um, as some of you may have noticed, we are recording this session for um, just to keep and share with people who may not have been able to make it tonight. And it will be available, I, I believe, on YouTube, just like with the other sessions. Um, and this series, if this is your first time, um, I tend to kind of do a mix of, you know, showing you the text. I will share my screen so you can kind of see the text. Um, but if you have the physical book, you can kind of follow along there as well. Um, I will point out things that I've noticed as a reader, writer, writing instructor, um, and, you know, at the same time, we can keep this casual and I would love for this to be as interactive as you would like it to be. So if at any point you have any thoughts or questions, you can just feel free to unmute and speak 
Um, while I'm sharing the screen, it might be hard for me to see, you know, physically if anybody is raising their hand. So just feel free to unmute and speak and we can kind of discuss from there. Um, let's see if there's any other kind of housekeeping notes I need to do. Um, at the very end, I will leave about 10 minutes just to open it up for general questions. So just know that that is an opportunity um, that I've kind of carved into our hour here. And um, yeah, I think I think we're ready to kind of dive in. Uh, before I do that, I'm, what, the last thing I'm going to do, I'm going to share um, the PDF of, oh, I don't know if I can do that. Um, I was going to share my PDF with you through the chat, but it looks like it's, I'm having a little technical difficulty. So hopefully you either have the book in front of you or you can kind of follow along as I screen share, uh, which I'm about to do now. Let's see. All right. Here we are. I scanned some of these pages yesterday and I think they're pretty good. Um, Dead End Memories, Stories by Banana Yoshimoto. Translated from the Japanese by Asa Yoneda. This is a translator to watch out for, by the way. Um, she has also translated many other contemporary Japanese literature, and I've just been so impressed. Um, you know, I think every translator kind of has um, their niche. Like, I, I, I see that um, Haruki Murakami typically works with a handful of the same translators for his books, and, you know, with all of these new Japanese literature books that are being translated, um, you will start to recognize, I think, if you keep following along, you'll start to recognize some of these translators' names. And I will say that Asa Yoneda, um, her work is really, really phenomenal. I feel like she really understands the Japanese nuance and is able to communicate it in such um, smooth kind of you know, in, in a contemporary voice. So, um, you know, if you're encountering this for the first time and I'm sharing this along with you, maybe you'll notice that this really reads uh, so smoothly and like something that was written maybe even today. Um, it's, in other words, it doesn't feel like, like any sort of stilted, distant work. Um, it's really kudos to the translator. And here I have a little bio and a picture of Banana Yoshimoto. Um, I actually got to sit in on a Zoom event about a month ago where she appeared in conversation with American novelist Brian Washington uh, through an interpreter. She looked just like this. <laughs> I don't know when this picture was taken, but she is just so, you know, um, youthful and um, she was just so warm um, and welcoming to many questions. And she talked to us about her favorite type of cheese. And, you know, she was just very unintimidating and really approachable, um, just such a wonderful person to, you know, get to know through her writing. But I, I realized also just in person, she is, you know, um, kind of similar to her narrators. Um, but in case you're not familiar, just a little quick overview of Banana Yoshimoto. Uh, Banana is a pseudonym, by the way, <laughs> and uh, she is the author of the international bestseller Kitchen, which was published in Japan in 1988. The translation of that came out in 1993. So um, some of you may remember this event, you know, um, in the 90s and even in the early 2000s, when you thought of Japanese literature, it still was, you know, a lot of just like kind of similar household names, and Banana Yoshimoto definitely was one of them. Today, we are very lucky to have many, many more on that list, but um, it's really great to have her translation, uh, a translation of her work come out kind of at the same time as all these other contemporary works as well. Uh, but she was born in 1964 in Tokyo, and the things that we're about to read, the stories here were actually first published in Japan in 2003. Um, and then the translation came out this year. So there is kind of that length of time. But um, like I said, because of the translators kind of hard work, it really um, sort of feels timeless in a way. And let's see. Oh, I, I wanted to, for those of you who kind of came in a few minutes later, this is something that um, I showed the group in the very beginning. But this is the Japanese cover of the same book. Uh, it's called Dead to End no Omoide, literally translated to Dead End Memories. You can see that the American cover 
took a lot of inspiration from the original. They're both a fallen yellow ginkgo leaves, something that um, appears in one of her stories that we'll take a look at. And in this Japanese one, it looks like two children running through a park. But there is an afterword here in Japanese that I don't think was translated for the English edition, but um, I will summarize very briefly that she wrote that um, she drafted these stories when she was about one month away from giving birth. And it was also immediately following the death of her beloved dog. So you can imagine there's a lot of emotions going on. She's about to give birth. She just lost her beloved dog. And she wrote these stories. Um, and it's a book that she says she's really grateful to have written, one that she considers her most precious work. So um, yeah, it's uh, it, it, this is a book that I've actually read multiple times, <laughs> um, not just for pleasure, but also to review uh, recently. And once more, again, in pre preparation for this event, and I feel like every time I read it, I just come away feeling so warm and cozy and, um, you know, it's it's just, uh, we'll, we'll get into, you know, all the nitty gritty of why this book is as wonderful as it is. But that's kind of a, an overview of the author and the book. And um, before we get back to the text, I just wanted to point out that um, some of the things that I'm going to talk about tonight, a lot of it will have to do with Japanese food. Um, so if you're a fan of Japanese food, this might really resonate with you. Um, but Nana Yoshimoto is someone who is a, a writer who is so great at using food to drive a story forward or to reveal something about a character. Um, she just kind of knows what she's doing. It's, it's never accidental. When you see a food item in a story, you just know that that has deeper meaning. Um, and food, um, you might associate it with comfort food. But in one of the stories that we'll take a look at tonight, that's the second story in this book, um, food is actually used as a weapon. So, you know, she is someone who can kind of do both. And it's really kind of astounding to see a writer be able to work like that on two kind of polar opposites of food. Um, other topics that she deals with are chosen families. Um, and one thread that I noticed throughout all of these five things is five stories is that the characters seem to have already sort of experienced like a childhood trauma or maybe they're going through a traumatic event but that by the end of the story they kind of there's a very similar arc of you know they go through something really really terrible and tragic and by the end of it they're sort of you know able to pull away from that and so you'll notice that similar kind of pattern coming up over and over and um, at the Zoom event that I attended that I mentioned, um, Banana actually, she mentioned that she has always been fascinated with death. And this is another thing that will come up over and over. Um, and the reason she thinks she's gravitated towards this topic is because she was a child when the author Yukio Mishima died very publicly in 1970 in Japan. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Japanese literature, Mishima was like, he was a very, um, you know, kind of controversial writer who made a lot of waves with a lot of novels. And well, he, you know, um, you can kind of look up his wiki afterwards if you're curious, but um, his death was, you know, it was, it was kind of laid out on television. It was very public and for, uh, Banana Yoshimoto, who was a child during that time, that really made a strong impact on her. And she said that the thing that she took away from it was that she felt the importance of living as long as we had bodies. So like no matter how life tough, how tough life gets, we have to keep on living. That's kind of like what she took away from that event. And the thing that I think knowing that about her, it kind of helps to put in context why some of her characters um, go through these things or end up, you know, um, being able to come out of that and why that's such an important lesson for the author herself. All right. Um, before we dive into the text, are there any kind of thoughts or questions about the author, the book, or any of the things that I mentioned in the overview? 
Um, I see a comment in the chats from Masami Tyson. She says, I remember vividly when Kitchen was first published. Um, I was a student at the time, blown away by how, how weird and yet so eloquent her writing was compared to any other writer at the time uh, when she read it in the original Japanese. Um, thank you for sharing that, Masami. Um, yes, she definitely stands out in, you know, in Japan, but also I think um, like translated into English. I think people are recognizing that she is she is very distinct. Yeah. All right. So unless, uh, yeah, feel free to unmute and speak if you ever have a burning thought or question, but I'm going to share my screen again. And we're gonna start with the first story of the collection, House of Ghosts. Um, let's see, there we go. House of Ghosts. I have to say, this is my personal favorite. I think this book started off really strong. Um, some story collections, you just kind of never know which one will stick with you. And for me, I knew even from reading it the first time that this was gonna be my favorite. Um, and uh, let's see, I have a feeling that people are gonna get tired of hearing my voice for the whole time. So I was wondering if I could ask a volunteer to read uh, a couple of paragraphs out loud. Um, I'm happy to read at any point. Thank you I'm so Allison. much. Thank, thank you, Alice. It's so good to have you here. Um, I would love for you to read um, just from the beginning and I'll tell you when to stop. Great. I'll have hot pot if you're offering, but eating alone's no fun. So why don't you join me? What I'd said was, can I treat you to a meal as a thank you for all those times you had my back at work? And that was what Iwakura said in response. I wasn't quite sure how to take an invitation like that from a boy who had his own apartment. This is Iwakura we're talking about, I thought. He probably doesn't mean anything by it. He'd already mentioned his building was nearby. And in any case, he'd said it so casually and with such an artless expression that my heart didn't give a single flutter. Iwakura had an intriguing mixture of bright and dark about him, like a cloudy midwinter sky which had somehow made me hold back from starting to like him. I couldn't see him giving me that heady feeling, that rush that makes you want to burst into a run, the things I was looking for in young love. I'll come over and cook, I said, and we picked up and we picked a date, matter of factly. We were by the bench under all the tall Zelkova on our college campus. I didn't have a lot of friends and the few times that I did have were too big, I'm sorry, my son was walking by, and the few that I did have were too busy with their part-time jobs to come to class much. It was the kind of thing that happened at low-tier private colleges like ours, so Iwakura and I had naturally become close simply from being two loners on campus. Uh, thank you. Actually, can you keep reading just a couple more paragraphs? Sure. We'd met when I was covering some shifts for a friend at a local place that served drinks and food where he worked behind the bar. After that, we'd stop to chat or eat lunch together whenever we saw each other on campus. His parents ran a famous bakery in our town that sold high-end roll, high-end cake rolls. He told me how, as the only child, he was doing everything in his power to save up enough money to avoid having to take over the family business after graduation. I believed him. There was a desperation about him that spoke of the lifetime of baking cake rolls that awaited him by default, unless he forged his own path. He went about his part-time job like someone who had his work cut out for him. Cake rolls? What's not to like? They're great, I said, having never turned down a cake roll in my life. I don't mind cake rolls, but my mom's practically perfect, friendly, thoughtful, hardworking, Iwakura said. It was true that his mom was well known in the community for being welcoming and attentive. People ended up buying cake rolls at their bakery just because of how she made them feel. I, I think I'm quite a nice person, he said. I agree. I'm going to gentle... pause there for a second. Thank you. I might ask you no to problem. keep reading a little bit more again, but I just wanted all of us to um, just kind of take in the opening of this short story, House of Ghosts, uh, the things that immediately kind of, you know, um, pop up is, like I mentioned, um, Banana Yoshimoto is probably one of the best writers to incorporate food into fiction writing, but we see from the very first line that hot pot is mentioned. 
And, you know, um, if you have never had Japanese hot pot, you are missing out. I hope that you get to have hot pot this year. It is such a wonderful fruit, and we can actually take a look at a later excerpt that describes the hot pot. But, um, you know, immediately we're getting these two characters, this woman and a man um, who are, you know, around college students age, they are going to come together to, you know, have hot pot together. And this is just an exchange, like she, you know, he did her a favor, and so she's going to return the favor with a hot pot. And just, you know, from the second page too, we get all of these details of their other connections to food. Um, High-end cake rolls. This is another thing that um, actually, I, I think this is something that, you know, if you go to Tokyo today and go to a department store, you can still find high-end cake rolls and people will still line up for them. Um, but I, you know, looking at sort of the scope of Japanese history, this seems to have been kind of um, a very popular thing. Remember, these stories were first written around the late 80s. So we're thinking like, you know, hairsprays and hair. <laughs> it's kind of in the middle of the bubble. Uh, it's just a very kind of um, uh, like, you know, the, the 80s in America, you can kind of picture that pretty vividly. It was, you know, in Japan, it had a, it had a different kind of distinct feel of, yes, there was that kind of exuberance in the air, a um, lot of vivid colors. But I think with food too, like, you know, um, this is something that in this particular era, there was just so much kind of um, like luxurious kind of food that I think, you know, was probably at like the highest point since the post-war era. We're, we're talking only like three decades since the end of the war. So uh, just try to imagine like that setting as well, that Showa era landscape. Um, and some of these foods too, even though they were written in the late 80s, uh, they're foods that have endured in Japan as well. So later we'll see um, mentions of omuraisu, which is omelet rice, um, like omelet on top of this rice that's been stir fried with ketchup and onion and sometimes bell pepper. That's still something that everybody eats today. And just other like foods that I think um, they're just so she chose, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is she may have been writing about foods that were just around her at the time, but it's really interesting that those foods are still very, very much part of Japanese culture today, even decades later. Can um, I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead. So this collection was published in 2003 in Japan, but so the, some of the stories are older than that? Yes, so I actually okay, I didn't realize that. Yeah, in the um, you know, in the press release for Dead End Memories, uh, the English edition, they did say first published in two thousand three. That's what it says in the flap. But um, you know, I when you look back at the at the Japanese edition, um, it does. I I was able to find that um, at least one of these was from the late eighties. So, um, oh, that's that's really interesting. Yeah, it might have been the case that maybe they were published in like a different, um, like before it was published as, as, a, as a book of collections. But I, I will have to look into that a little bit more um, if you're curious, but. Um, yeah, I'd love to know which one, but I mean, obviously, yeah. I mean, <laughs> cool, thank you. And um, let's see, uh, looking at my notes here. Um, all right. I wanted to kind of show you another spot in the story. Oh, this is a, yeah, we were just about to get into this really great dialogue about what being nice means. And this is something that I know that we're, you know, doing this event through the Japan America Society of Tennessee. And we have a lot of kind of like Southerners in the room. And one thing that I continue to find fascinating about being a Japanese person in the South is how much Japanese culture and American Southern culture have in common. And I feel like this passage that we're about to see about, you know, um, being nice, I feel like might resonate. Um, so maybe we can take a quick look at that. Uh, would somebody um, be willing to unmute and read from, I think I'm quite a nice person.
I will, Yurina. Okay, thank you so much. Let's see, hang on a sec. Um, I, think, I, I think I'm quite a nice person, he said. I agree. His gentle spirit and his good upbringing were obvious to me from just our walks together. If we were in the park and the trees swayed in the wind and made the light dance, he would half close his eyes and look blissful. If a child tripped and fell, he'd frown. And when the parent picked the child up afterward, he'd look sympathetic and relieved. There was a candor about him I noticed in people whose parents had given them something unconditional and absolute growing up. If I stay home with my family for the rest of my life, I'll just get more and more nice. And that would be a problem because it's fine, except the way I see it, it's not real. Anyone can be kind when they've got enough money and free time and no problems, don't you think? What I'm saying is if I stay home, that's all my niceness will ever be. And either something dark and unpleasant starts building up inside me or I'm stuck with that superficial niceness until I die. I'm lucky to be easygoing by nature and I want to make sure that's what I feed, not the dark stuff. That's why you're so desperate to save up and leave. Maybe it's something like that. I'm just trying to look one step ahead. Otherwise I'll end up doing cake rolls without ever having known anything different. And then I'd really be stuck, Iwakura said. The college we went to was expensive. In my case, I ended up there because my parents were both busy at the restaurant around the time I was born and enrolled me in the kindergarten of the school attached to the college where I'd come up through the system ever since. My family ran a fairly well-known Yoshiko, Yoshiku, sorry, restaurant in the next town over, which had been started by my grandparents. It was the kind of place listed in all the tourist guidebooks where a family would stop by for a meal out or a single office worker would go for a nice dinner after work when they didn't want to stretch for a French restaurant. I wanted to run the place someday, so in truth, I was more interested in learning to do that than in getting my degree. The restaurant's menu was unchanged from my grandparents' time, and I'd been trained from a young age to make things like omu rice, uh, pilaf, and demi glace. All I really needed to do before I could take on the restaurant was to get my chef's license. Uh, we're going to pause there for a second. Thanks so much for reading. Um, yes, and the other you know element of food here is that she works at a yoshoku restaurant, and yoshoku literally means kind of Western food, which I think at this point, we can say it's like a Japanese interpretation of Western food. So you'll, you know, in a Yoshoku restaurant, you'll find things oftentimes served with rice um, and miso soup. Um, but unlike a more kind of traditional washoku or, you know, Japanese restaurant, um, which, you know, in a, in a Japanese restaurant, you would get more, you know, quote unquote, traditional Japanese food served. And you would never really see spaghetti or um or like a hambagu which is kind of like a beef patty served with a demi glace sauce on uh, things like that so we're kind of you know seeing these two characters one of them working with high-end cake rolls which is very kind of european and one who's working at a yoshoku restaurant and they're both coming together too with this like um with this weight, like their, their families have certain expectations of them, whether to carry on that business or, you know, the, the girl, she, her family kind of doesn't expect her to take it on, but um, in her heart, she actually wants to. And this discussion about real and nice, is just really interesting because this is a kind of theme that um, I kind of recognize even in American literature sometimes of people who are feeling stuck, like protagonists who are saying, I'm going to get out of this town and, you know, do something different from what my parents want me to do. And uh, to see it kind of expressed in the story, uh, what we can also kind of take a look later at how um, things turn out for, for the two of them. But um, does anybody have any quick thoughts or questions about this, this excerpt? If not, I also want to move on to the ghosts. You know, the story is called House of Ghosts, and I want to show you how the ghosts are depicted. Um, and we can always come back to the food as well. But um, I'm going to scroll down just a little bit. 
You can keep thinking about your thoughts and questions if you like, but here is a little excerpt. This is page 13. Um, so this is when she's preparing the hot pot and I'll just kind of go through the little things to notice. So she says, it's going to be a simple dish of chicken meatballs, Chinese cabbage and glass noodles. Are you happy with udon to finish? This is a treat, Iwakuya smiled. And so, um, you know, this is something that they're, uh, that she's cooking for him. And while she's doing that, he's putting on some music, reading a book. They watch TV, fill their bellies with hot pot. Uh, time passed normally and our conversation didn't turn romantic at all. And then after the hot pot, he serves coffee and cuts a cake roll. And so for this one long kind of, you know, this is a whole page just dedicated to describing them cooking and eating the food together from start to finish all the way up to the coffee and cake roll. And it's just, I don't know, like it, even after reading it three times, I just, I read this and I get really hungry <laughs> for all of the things mentioned here. And she's just so good at doing that. All right. So the next part, page 14, this is when we see the first mention of the ghost. Um, let's see. So uh, a little bit of context, the, the building that they are in, that Iwakura is in, it belongs to a family member. And, you know, it's, it, it's kind of this, it's already a bit of a spooky um, building because there's not much else there. And they know that the building's going to be torn down soon. Um, but, you know, Iwakura um, mentions that uh, the people, the, the people who used to live here, the landlords, and you can see in the dialogue on page 14 here, he says, uh, you know, um, they're still here. It seems like there's still people here. They both kind of noticed this. And he says, the two of them fell asleep with their uh, brazier lit and died of carbon monoxide poisoning, the landlord and landlady. I mean, they were elderly, but still in this room, that's what happened. And, um, and oh, and, and a little bit above that, he says that like, it seems like there are other people here um, that they've kind of, they don't seem to have noticed that they're dead. That's the key part, right? And at the end, uh, this, this is another great little bit of dialogue where he says, um, I don't think there's any harm in it. They look really happy here. So I feel like in typical kind of, you know, we're entering Halloween season, at least in Nashville, all of my neighbors have already kind of put out their Halloween decorations. And so I'm sure people are starting to be gravitated towards these ghost stories. But I think in this Banana Yoshimoto rendition of a ghost story, it's a lot more kind of matter of fact. There's, you know, and, and especially with this couple, this elderly couple that are just kind of lingering there in this kitchen. Uh, there's no, you know, they're not poltergeists. They're just, they're just kind of quietly there. And even the protagonist here, the, the young woman, she doesn't seem that perturbed by it. In fact, later on, we see that she really feels this kind of, um, you know, kinship with them. And, um, you know, this is just a lovely way, I think, to write ghosts in fiction and incorporating food among that too. Um, let's see, moving on a little bit. Oh yes, and here's another great example of the landlords. So the protagonist asks her mother who runs the restaurant, do you remember that old couple who died in that building? And the mom says, yes, I remember. And she describes them here, all right. Can I have a volunteer read? Um, let's see. Read just these couple of paragraphs from page 19. Starts, we had closed and cleared the tables. I can read if you like, Irina. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah, so you said from we had closed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we had closed and cleared the tables, and mom and I were sitting at the counter eating our staff meal of crab pilaf and miso soup. The soup was grandma's own recipe. If someone had told me that I'd been put on this earth solely to pass down the taste of this miso soup to future generations, 
I wouldn't have minded one bit. There was something almost magically inviting about it. Of course, grandma had always made her miso paste from scratch. They used to come in often, not so much once the gentlemen started to have trouble walking, but weekday evenings before the rush, they'd come in holding hands. Table six, omi rice and pork curry with side plates so they could share. Um, thank you. And if you could read a little bit more from page 21, where we see um, the protagonist, she's talking about that old couple one more time and that grandmother as well who made that homemade miso soup. So if you could read from maybe on some level, that would be great. Okay. Maybe on some level, my dream of taking on the restaurant came from a petty place was just something I'd convinced myself of out of stubbornness. Perhaps I'd taken the feelings I had about my brother, not accepting what was being offered to him on a platter. Perhaps I'd let, him, let them ferment into a kind of complex and laid them on myself. When my grandma died though, it made me realize something. At the funeral, middle-aged men whom grandma had fed and counseled when they were young men turned up in black suits and told stories about times they brought their dates for meals at the restaurant or how she comforted them with fried prawns when their girlfriends broke up with them. For the first time, I saw the difference we made by being there for people over the years in the background of their lives. Oh, let's pause there for a second. Thank you so much. Um, and then let's see, just to show you one last excerpt from the story. Um, Later on, the you know, spoiler alert, they get together, <laughs> the, the, the young woman and man, they meet a little later in life. Um, and this is one of the things that they do. Let's see. Oh, this might be even, sorry, I'm jumping timelines here. This is when they're still kind of together when they're young. But um, before he sort of leaves to go on an, an apprenticeship to be able to learn how to make these high-end cake rolls, even better. Uh, they get together and she makes pork curry and omuraisu just for that, elderly, uh, in, in a way to honor that elderly couple and with this kind of renewed realization in mind. And she says that she made them with as much care and attention as I could. I'm sort of reading a little bit from page 42. And uh, later, you know, from the middle, she says, I was trying to say with these dishes, thank you for coming to us all those years. It was an honor to do this for you. Most of the food was for Iwakura and me, but we plated up small portions on a paper plate and put them on the windowsill. We placed the chrysanthemum in a paper cup next to it, lit some incense, and put our palms together and prayed for their spirits to move on when the building was torn down. We left them a small bottle of beer too. Um, just a couple things to notice before I open it up to discussion is that this is something that is very customary in Japanese culture, that we honor you know, um, those who have died. Uh, sometimes families will kind of make a little, um, depending on their sort of religious affiliations, they'll have a little um, place in their house, maybe a corner of the house or maybe near the ceiling. Or um, I know in my family's case, it was sort of near the, um, the door, the entrance. But um, every time that um, it was like a holiday or their birthday or something, we would offer little foods on a plate next to maybe pictures of them or next to their ashes. And so it's it's really interesting that in this story, we see these two people who never really knew this elderly couple directly, but they're kind of in that same space where the ghosts are still lingering, that they're offering them this food um, before the two of them sort of part for a little bit and before this building gets torn down. Um, it's, it's really, I think, quite sweet and also just very true to... Uh, it really resonated with me, um, having come from a family that already did that. But um, I'm curious to, yeah, just kind of maybe open it up for a couple minutes to to the group um, to see if there were any sort of thoughts or questions about this, this story and these excerpts that we looked at. Um, in particular, this idea, too, I, I, I wanted to kind of take notice of this line from page 21 where she says that uh, she wanted to be, she saw the importance of being there for people in the background of their lives. Uh, I found this to be just so different from a lot of sort of um, Western narratives or stories of heroes and heroines who, um, 
who they don't they 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 want to be the the main the the spotlight right they want to be the the people to um not be in the background they want to be in the forefront and here she is saying that she she sees the importance of being in the background of other people's lives and this is something that i feel like we don't really see a lot in in stories so um before i ramble on and on i would love to hear any thoughts or questions from you all before we move on to some other excerpts i have a thought um, yeah go ahead just that there's an interesting dynamic in the story with the spaces the space of the restaurant that is like this timeless place that people come back to and it's always kind of the same experience and they're there the whole lives and then the timelessness of having the apartment that has, has a sense of timelessness because the ghosts are still there mm -hmm. and they still have a presence there. And that's very different kind of from our experience in the West because things are changing so rapidly that you don't, even if there was a place that you like to go to often, it's usually been torn down or moved out or now COVID's taken out a lot of these small businesses. So we don't have the similar experience anymore. That's true. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Um, any other uh, thoughts or responses to what Alicia said? So this is Masami. Um, just a few thoughts. So I found the um, the hot pot is, is it onabe? Onabe? Yes. Onabe -ryori. Okay, so I always find that to be very intimate. So first of all, the idea of eating together is very intimate in my mm -hmm. mind. And then for this couple who really weren't a couple to begin with, that he would say that's what he wants is sort of telling. I don't know. It's kind of, I, I knew they would get together at that point. Mm -hmm. um, and then to sort of share the secret about this ghost. Well, it's not a secret, but, you know, again... I don't know. I just, I just find it, you know, her writing to be so interesting in that somehow she's able to weave in these details to illustrate that intimacy without, you know, there being any words like love or, you know, mm -hmm. anything like that. So I, I agree with you that she is a master at using those details to illicit emotions at least in this reader's mind um by using everyday items and things like ghosts even and you know i i i i agree that this translation must be very good that that comes through yes thank you thank you for sharing um see if there's anyone else with with a thought or a question about this story um I think we can take one more before we move on to the, the next one. I, I am looking at the clock. We I know we're sort of starting to get closer to the seven o'clock mark, but um, I want to make sure that I'm not leaving anyone, you know. I was just going to say, this is also my favorite story. Oh, good. In the edition. The last one is maybe the most characteristically banana, but <laughs> this yes. one was my favorite. Can you tell us why it was your favorite? I don't know. This one felt kind of like Banana Yoshimoto all grown up. It actually has closure <laughs> and her mm. characters, like we see her characters grow and mature instead of just kind of a, a snapshot of a moment in their lives where we don't quite know what happens next. And I You're really right. liked that. Yeah. And all of the five stories, I think this one has kind of the most epic of arcs. Like we see these two people over the course of decades um, whereas you're right, in some of these other stories, like I'm thinking of, um, there's one, I think, titled um, Not Warm at All, and also Tomo-chan's Happiness. Those are the third and fourth stories of this collection. Um, they really are just very, very short, either a distant memory that she's just recounting, or something that takes place within maybe a couple months. So yeah, this one definitely feels like it's going through a lot of time, but also allowing room for these characters to grow for sure. Yeah. Um, so I wanna point out that, uh, let's see, I'm gonna stop sharing this PDF and start sharing the next portion. 
Um, da, 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 da. Wait, is it the same? Can you see? Oh, sorry. Um, where? There it is. Okay. There we go. Is everybody seeing this PDF that I'm sharing? And it's, it says mama at the top. Great. Um, I don't know that we'll have a lot of time to go through this one, but I did want to just point out, this is the second story in the collection. And like I said, it's kind of like doing the opposite of House of Ghosts, where instead of food being something of comfort and something that brings two people together, this story is about how food you can just see, I'm not really spoiling much. In the very first page, she give, gives it away. She, um, It's lunchtime at her office at the staff cafeteria, and she's hungry. She orders the vegetable curry. And then she even says here, for a split second, the Wakayama curry poisoning case crossed my mind. So, you know, if, if an author is going to mention something like that, you just know it's like the Chekhov, you know, like if you mention a gun, the gun has to fire at some point in the story. She already mentions poison in this very first page. So you kind of get this very eerie feeling that, oh, like she's she's going to get poisoned. Um, and this is a story that is kind of about this woman who becomes a victim of a poisoning, not personally targeted. Uh, it's just this like disgruntled employee who decides to make a point and she is just on the receiving end of that. And it is very unfortunate and it, the story goes through the kind of like day-to-day -day consequences of her recovering at the hospital. Um, this is page 65, you know, people are visiting her. The president of the company comes to give her flowers and she's just kind of overwhelmed. And she doesn't, you know, she's still kind of trying to figure out like what's going on. But what is really, really fascinating about this particular story is, you know, so we immediately see how food is used as a weapon. And then there are these little tiny moments throughout, sprinkled throughout, like this is on page 74, when she's being treated at the hospital, when people are visiting her, um, and her boyfriend's mom brings in, this is translated as tasty soft kanji. Kanji, I think, is more associated with like Chinese um, soft rice, like you know, rice that, that's been kind of cooked very slow and it's all kind of mushy and uh, really great for people who are recovering from colds and things like that. But in Japanese, this is okayu. And, um, you know, this is something that she's eating. And at the end of the section, she says, it made me think that this was how it felt to be loved. And that's another kind of interesting way to put this because it, on the one hand, it's really heartwarming, but also you know, there's an undertone, there's this kind of darker undertone of why, why is this something that she thinks? Um, and we kind of get, you know, layer by layer, it's like we see um, her childhood past and the trauma that was kind of deeply sort of, you know, just really deep in her, her um, psyche just kind of start to come out because catalyzed by this poisoning incident. And so this story titled Mama, which in Japanese is Okasan, um, it's one of the many ways we say mother in Japanese, but this story is, oof, um, it's, it's quite heavy. And, um, but like I mentioned in the very beginning, you can be reassured that like, you know, as is, as I kind of framed this book and the collection, it, you end somehow, despite all of these terrible things happening, by the end of the story, you you kind of end in this um, renewed, you know, um, she, she comes out of it a new person. And she even says here she is five pounds heavier. She is keeping busy. She's happy. And, you know, it, it, this is an interesting one um, because... You, you still, I, at least for me as a reader, I kind of left wondering, like, that was a really big thing that she went through, and I wonder if she's going to be okay. But Banana Yoshimoto seems to write her as someone who's able to kind of crawl out of that okay, so maybe we can trust her. But um, let's see, in the remaining couple minutes, I also just... I, I feel really bad that I'm kind of speeding through this, but I also want to respect everyone's time. Um, as I think Allison mentioned, the very last story, Dead End Memories, this is 
I would agree. This this feels like a very classic Banana Yoshimoto kind of story. Um, if you are familiar with her other works, um, it's oh, this is one thing that is really interesting. Um, in her interview, she said that you know one thing that she's really interested in doing with her characters is instead of um, hold on, I'm going to stop sharing for a second. So she thinks that you know sometimes in life people are given these kind of choices in front of them, like choose A, B, or C, and you kind of choose one and go with it. And maybe that's like your education system leading you one way or your parents or your friends or coworkers or society. I don't know, like for whatever reason, we're kind of pulled, gravitated towards these different life choices. And Banana Yoshimoto, she wants to use her stories to ask the question, what if there's an X, not just ABC, but what if there's like a totally different path that the character can take that's just outside of what they had ever envisioned for themselves. And so that is, I think, a good context for the last story, Dead End Memories, which I know we're running out of time, but if you do end up reading it on your own time, I do want you to have that at the back of your head of, you know, um, if you want to see a character go through a life event and instead of doing what is kind of expected of her or what she thinks she should do she does something kind of very different and um throughout the story she also she and her her friend they keep asking each other kind of what what does it mean to be happy so dead end memories is a story that really is not afraid to ask these questions head on and is very earnest and um, it also leaves you with a very beautiful description of fallen leaves. I'm just going to share that one with you before we leave. Um, the very last one, page 217. This is from Dead End Memories. And, you know, you can just kind of imagine the book covers with the ginkgo leaves. But she even says, yeah, it was a breathtaking sight. This is bottom of page 216. Fallen leaves formed banks on the ground beneath the trees leading into the distance. Everything was yellow. The whole scene was bathed in sunlight and drifts of leaves covered the road surface delicately like a golden snowfall and disappeared into the distance. It's beautiful, I said. Doesn't it remind you of snow, Nishiyama said. I got out of the car and strode away from it, my shoes rustling the dry leaves. I relished their pleasant smell, their weightlessness. The light washed over the trees. We were practically the only ones there and the atmosphere felt holy, as though we were really in a snowy landscape or in heaven. The leaves which came almost to my knees were springy underfoot and flew into the air on the breath of a whisper. The soft layers absorbed everything. Far away, I heard bird calls and sound of the city. Nishiyama got us hot coffee from a vending machine, and we traipsed all around for a long time, swishing through the leaves and getting our knees dirty like children. There was no past, no future, no words, nothing. Just the light and the yellow and the scent of dry leaves in the sun. The entire time I felt surrounded by happiness. I mean, it's, isn't that just, oh, I could just read that over and over. Um, so I hope that, you know, if you do get a chance that you can pick up this book and really kind of go through um, and notice all of the food descriptions. Oh, another little tidbit I really need to mention is that this book you'll see is dedicated to Fujiko F. Fujio. And I wonder if some of you know who that is. <laughs> Um, Fujiko F. Fujio. That's the creator of a beloved Japanese character. Does anybody have a good Doraemon. guess? Doraemon. Yes, yes, Doraemon. And Doraemon, if you're not familiar, um, you should look him up. He's an adorable cartoon blue robot cat. It's very hard to describe without it sounding convoluted, but really he is just so beloved in Japan. This book is dedicated to the creator. And if you read the book knowing that, you will kind of see, you know, with the parallels. Um, some of the characters actually even mention Doraemon throughout. And just like Doraemon's kind of, um, like, the, the, the feeling that Doraemon evokes is one of adventure, possibility, imagination. Um, and I think she plays around with all of those in her own way despite the fact that these stories are very realistic they're not fantastical well, they don't have to do with robots but you will see some parallels with the beloved character and um yeah i hope that 
regardless of your exposure to Japanese literature, I think this one is a really great gateway into Banana Yoshimoto's canon. And um, I even want to show you so many of her other books that have been translated. Of course, there's Kitchen, but there's also Goodbye Tsumugi, which won a very prestigious award. It's a very short, this one is a novel, I believe, and Moshi Moshi. I'm actually working through this right now, and it has a beautiful kind of cover. Um, but yeah, there's just so much of her her work out there for, for you to keep reading if you enjoyed this. Um, and yes, yeah, somebody just put in the wiki that uh, or the chat that Doraemon is still on Netflix. So something to, yeah, if you're looking for something new to watch, I highly recommend it. Um, Are they subtitled? I thought those, I couldn't find anything subbed. <laughs> in I, English. I will have to check on that. I, yeah. Um, look, that would I be awesome. You can, you can find stuff on YouTube. Last time I looked, they were subtitled by somebody who didn't know English oh, dear. well enough to okay. recognize what swear words were. Oh, oh no. no. <laughs> <laughs> really amusingly subtitled with F words littered throughout. Oh, man. <laughs> but well, thank hope, you. Yeah, hopefully if it's Netflix, I think maybe the subtitles or the dub should be a little bit more legit than that. Um, all right. Well, we're you know uh, past the seven o'clock mark, so um, I, I will um, will will close out of the session today. I want to say thank you again to the Japan America Society of Tennessee. Um, I will continue to host these events throughout the year, usually every few months, um, and be the first to know by subscribing to the Jazz newsletter. Um, or, you know, I, I talk about Jast all the time on my socials, so you can find me. But um, yeah, thank you all. And I'm going to turn it over actually to Ginger. I think she has a few notes. Yeah, you thank all. you, Rena. Thank you, Yurina. Um, time went by so fast. I could I know. <laughs> for another hour talking about this book, but that last section that you read was really beautiful. So thank you very much. Thank you to everybody for joining us. Um, as Yurina mentioned and Madeline, um, in the beginning, um, you know, we do have a lot of upcoming events, so please uh, follow us on the Jazz Facebook page and check the Jazz website for our upcoming events and also the date of the next uh, Reading Between the Lines with the wonderful Yurina Yoshikawa. And I hope uh, everyone has a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you all.